Welcome to Beyond the Game, Wealth Mastery for Athletes. I'm Chris Benson, private equity real estate investor, and I'm joined by nine-year NFL vet Alec Ogletree. Beyond the Game is a podcast where we will provide a playbook for financial growth both on and off the field. Join us each week as we'll have in-depth conversations with other pro athletes as they walk us through how they've created wealth beyond the game both on and off the field. They're going to share their triumphs, lessons learned, and setbacks along the way so that you don't make the same mistakes. Join us. I think you're going to have a lot of fun. All right, guys. Today on Beyond the Game, we had Lily Abdelmalik from Dynamic Speed and Agility right here in Marietta, Georgia. She is a strength conditioning speed coach in the Georgia area for a ton of pro athletes. She's trained some of the biggest names you know. She had some great lessons on entrepreneurship, but first, she told us that she thought she could kill a bear with her bare hands. Highly unlikely based on the size and stature of Lily. Uh, Number two, she taught us that you have to pay taxes to the IRS. Who knew? Both personally and for her business. Great story there. And number three, she shared with us what she thought her best lesson was as an entrepreneur. She's built a really successful business. And I think those lessons are translatable across all aspects of business, whether you're just getting started or have an established one. So join us on this episode. I think you're going to like it. Welcome to uh, Beyond the Game today. Uh, I'm Alec Ogletree, obviously, and we got... Very and Chris Benson, hosted by Chris Benson as well. Um, but today we got a special guest in uh, Lily. Lily, I can't pronounce your last name to save my life it's before okay. I, so I'm not gonna try to butcher it at this time. But uh, yeah, no, we um, we appreciate you coming on and uh, joining us today. Uh, we we definitely wanted to get you on here to because you have a lot of insight on one. You own a gym. Well, not, you own a gym. You have a, a a practice of training, right? At DSA, which is Dynamic Sports and Agility, right? Oh my God, you're butchering it all I'm up. Butcher. Dy- so we better DSA. start with the last name. DSA. Dynamic okay. Speed okay. and Agility. Yeah. Dynamic. Sorry, speed I don't know why I said sport. It's all good. <laughs> I'm sorry, but DSA they can they can edit that out for us too. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, you at DSA um, and. You've been there for a while. You started from the ground up. Um, so, you know, that's a very commendable thing to do. Uh, I know it's hard. It's not easy as you we kind of talked before the show. But, uh, yeah, I'm excited to have you on here to hopefully have you share some insight, share some stories of how you journeyed through this, how you continue to grow your brand and, and just build um, your life around it. Yep. So, but Lily, well, thanks for having me. I have a better first question, though. Okay. What's the biggest animal you could kill with your bare hands? That's oh. that's the first question. You, here's the context: you you animal is gonna kill you either way. Okay. So like like a house cat, but this is like a rabid house cat. It's gonna smoke you. So the whatever animal you choose, you can't pick like a friendly animal because okay. that animal is going to kill you. When I asked Alec this question, Alec, do you remember what you started with? It was the stupidest answer I've ever heard. Do you remember? I can't remember. I probably oh. said like a lion or something. No, you said a whale. You said you're yeah, going to kill a oh, whale. Yeah. I killed that whale. That <laughs> whale will die. <laughs> so, Lily, this is always a fun one. Okay. You got to give me the animal and then what the strategy is. And there's no right or wrong answer. The fun part is the debate around it. And then we could talk about dynamic speed and agility. Okay. So, okay. I got the oh. animal, a bear, a black bear. I, I mean, a black bear. No, yeah. yeah, a bear. I, why? Well, my strategy to get away is what I've heard is that bears can't like they're not very agile. They just like can only really run fast straight. I think that's an alligator. I'm pretty that's sure bears bear? run like 30 miles an hour. They do, but but. Bear, they, I, Aren't I heard you supposed that too. to like zigzag when you're yeah. being chased by a bear? Yeah. No, I'm going to Google that right this now. This is a real thing. I'm pretty thing. sure that's an so alligator. So I feel like, one, I'll get away because I'm just going to be like super agile. <laughs> but that's not. And but, then, wait, but that's not what the question if is. If I had to kill that it. That is the question. She getting away. I'm getting away. <laughs> she ain't go I'm reading the on the Black Bears Internet Center for Wildlife and Dangerous. Bears walk a shuffling gait, but they're quite agile and very quick. Wait, I you have to kill this animal. Oh, so I would, if I had to kill the animal, what would I do? No. Can I have a weapon? Zero. 
I'd strangle bear it. Hand. What, a my, bear? I would strangle the bear. You, that's the stu- That's worse I'd than the whale that, answer. Strangle put the the paws on strangle the, a bear, the paws it's, it's, no it's going to swipe you across the throat and cut your jugular immediately. But you told me I'm going to die anyway. No, no, that's the point. The animal is trying to kill you. You have to kill it first. But I have no weapon. That's why you got to pick the right animal and the best strategy. I mean, put them paws on a lily. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> That's what Alec told me. He's like, "You see my hands?" I'm like, "Alec, it's a whale. Like hey, the whale's gonna kill you." Two of them, Chris, killed a bear. Gave two of them. Better use them. <sighs> two I'd very entice, disappointing answers. I would entice the bear with like food. <laughs> the bear's not interested. I'd... He's in a rage. The bear is. You just punched his cub in the face. He is. She. The mom is angry. These are I mean, Alec. You and Lily have given the two worst answers to this question I've ever heard. A bear. The bear would. Just no offense, Lily. The bear's gonna kill you. All right, now we can move Not back even. on to the career. All right, so to to a real question. Okay. So where where did you grow up? Like, what what's your background? How did you get into athletic training? I mean, so walk me through athlete as a kid. Um, you know, my parents really didn't put me in like organized sports like that. I was kind of one of those. I ran around in the streets, played games in the streets, you know, street hockey, soccer, you know, baseball. I was just, like, running around. I mean, not to say I tried to run track at school because my friends were running track or, like, I had some history in, like, dance and stuff like that. But not something that, like, I stuck to and, like, found, like, a good drive with it where I felt like I wanted to go play, you know, college sports or anything like that yeah um so I grew up in St. Louis doing that and then I went to the University of Florida where I got my degree in physiology and kinesiology had an internship in Atlanta and I never turned back mm. With, we just had two gators on that's what that's Mac right because we're the best I hear, hear that Alec gotta change something <laughs> no but uh so when when did you start? I guess as far as your athletic training, like when did you start wanting to be? When did you, what did you, what happened to make you be like, I want to go into training. I want to go into. I, well, I guess you say you got the internship for. What do you say kinesiology yeah. is what you said. I mean, I wanted. I always knew I wanted to do something in sports. I wasn't mm-hmm. sure if I was going to go like sports medicine or physical therapy. Um, I ended up with the internship here. And I kind of got the best of both worlds. So I learned a little bit about the physical therapy aspect and just working with healthy athletes that were preparing for their seasons. Um, mm-hmm. I loved it, and I just kind of stayed with it, got hired on. Where, where did that come from? Was it Were you, like, the caretaker as a kid of your brothers and sisters and friends? like, Or was medicine a path for you? Did you think, like, hey, I'm going to be a doctor, and this is just... Yeah, I think it was more just I loved just the aspect of sports and mm. how people can have the ability to move the way they do and kill bears with their bare hands. Yeah, kill bears with their <laughs> bare hands. Um, but I mean, I just, I found it fascinating, like how somebody can run as fast as they can, you know, like Olympic speeds. And it's like, how does the body do that? Like, you know, not knowing anything that genetics plays a huge part in that, but mm-hmm. um, I just, I found it really cool to see athletes you know work and move the way they do and it just kept me interested and and that's what drove you to the major yeah I started you know physical therapy it was great but um there was something about like working with athletes that really wanted to strive for something more Mm. um and so I think like um just you know the amount of intensity it took and their drive and their mindset was kind of what, what pushed me to keep going. Alec, like you with tennis, it's the same thing. Yeah. I mean, now that I've, I've always, I grew up watching it obviously, but, um, you know, now that I started playing, like I really found that, like I said, kind of that drive, that intensity, that, that hunger, that desire to win at all costs, kind of like I did with football how that was for me. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure it's I'll a different start, challenge. It's it different is. Challenge it is. It, it, it's a great challenge. But, like, some of the some of the movements are, like, the exact same as, like, what I did in football. 
And so I found it, like I said, I found it to be a lot easier and I enjoyed it too, obviously. Um, while I keep playing, but, uh, yeah. So Lily, tell me this. So when you first started, I'm assuming you just started out with first, like maybe two or three guys. You're like, what? I got a training. I got, I want to train you or like what? Like so, they reached out to you whatever you were with somebody else? I was kind of like in the right position. You know, I, when I worked for the different companies I worked for, the second company, they were, you know, servicing like athletes that were getting ready for combine training or like players that were preparing mm-hmm. in the off season to get ready for the season. And truthfully, I started training little kids. Um, but just to your yeah. point, like playing tennis, compared to like how you were as a linebacker, it's kind of very similar moves. Mm. And so I think I found my niche where it was like, you know, oh, I have the foundation of speed and agility and it kind of goes across the board for so many different athletes and sports that it was kind of like, I'm not just having to like, you know, service one group of, of athletes. I can really work with all different types, you know, females, mm-hmm. male. I mean, I I had Olympic fencers this past year. <laughs> Who trains an Olympic fencer? <laughs> <laughs> How do they train? They just do the same thing, right? Yeah, I mean, it's not very different <laughs> conditioning. They're more like forward to back, all very linear, mm, um, yeah. you know, but it's interesting, so. Did you have the little knife thing? With no, them? no, they wouldn't let me, they wouldn't let me hold her. Is it called a rapier? What's it called? It's not called a sword. It's called something. Eh, I'll have to look yeah. that up later. When Lily, when you when you interned in Atlanta, your first gig out of school, was that with athletes as well? Same thing, or was it more PT based? Or yeah, it was it was more just athletes getting ready. It was combine okay. athletes for the NFL. Um, and so you were in that world. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. So it, it was cool. I mean, once I got into. So, Lily, first job out of school, you, you mentioned you're working with athletes already, prepping for combine, and, and that's across all sports, I'm assuming? Yeah, different different athletes, but um, I ended up working under, like, a Olympic track coach. Okay. So I was, like, learning a whole bunch from him. Um, he was working with, like, a couple guys that um, were preparing for the NFL combine. Um, and then shortly after, um, I actually – a company called XBE Sports bought out um, that location. Okay. So then I kind of got grandfathered in as one of the trainers to train under um, Tony Villani. And that's where things started kind of like progressing for me in my career. Um, That's where I started really getting involved more with like NFL players. And we're talking about like linebackers like Takeo Spikes, running back Jamal Lewis. So it was like some of them old heads, you know. Um, and it was a different time and I learned a whole lot from him and, um, worked with basketball and tennis. Um, but then they relocated down to Florida. Oh, the whole facility. Yeah. His whole company. So it was kind of like, well, what do I do now? (laughs) How long were you there? Um, so from the, I got (laughs) here into Atlanta about 2005 and probably about 2000, Eight nine is when that transition was happening. Okay. Um, so and then I established my business. But why USA. didn't you go with them? What kept you here? Um, you know, there were guys who were still training, and I didn't want to leave them. Mm. And I enjoyed training them, so I was just like, "Well, I'll you know just keep working with you." Okay. And so then it kind of built up, and I established my business DSA Training, um, and they kept training with me, and. It, it literally started from like, you know, a couple guys, and it's grown, you know, throughout the years. So, you know, fourteen years later, or so it's incredible. Yeah. Wait, I've, I've long term. I have a quick question, Alex. So, did you growing up were you entrepreneurial, like from your parents, or did you have that model, or were you thinking about it when you were working for those companies? Because it's your first job out of school. Mm-hmm. Like, were you thinking like I could do this? I'm gonna open my own facility. Absolutely not. <laughs> When I was training, I was, like, seeing how um, Tony worked for himself and just being a business owner. My dad worked for himself. And I was like, hell no. I don't know. Like, that's too much. Like, I just want to collect a check. I want to live a modest life. 
get married, and I'm going to be about my way. So none of this was in my plans. And yeah. It's funny how that stuff works out. I know. I wasn't planning on doing this at all. So company leaves. You're staying in Atlanta. How many guys literally? Like five? Probably had like four guys. Okay. So they're saying, hey, Lily, we want you to stay. We'll pay you. And you're like, all right. Actually, I didn't charge one soul. And I <laughs> used their likeness to get high school kids to come train with me. So Takio and Jamal and Wayne Gandy, you know, he came out of Auburn. He was okay. an O-line. Was in the league for like 16 years. I was training all of them for free. And I was like, well, I just want to show people that I'm training you guys and get the high school kids to come in and pay me. But what year was this? Social media wasn't as Mm-mm. big as it is now. No, you know, I had to go around, show the flyers, talk to coaches. I had to do it the, Yeah, I had to do it a little differently. Like, I had to really be, like, a salesperson and train train some of, like, the elite kids for free, the ones that I knew that were going to go to, like, UGA and – and that's what I did. And I got everybody else to pay me. Wow. So schmucks like me, Alex, she she was showing me pictures of you saying, Chris, you can be like Alec Ogletree. <laughs> and yeah, then I was the like, one that, Yeah, you, I could do that shit. Yeah, okay. you were training for free, and I was up. the one who had to write the check. <laughs> yeah. But, Good for you. I mean, like, Takio, his last seven years in the league, he was training with me. And, you know, I guess it paid off for him mm-hmm. and some other guys. So That's incredible. What a cool story. And play seven more years. Did did yeah. did you did you have a plan? Like, what was when the first four guys were like, "Yeah, I'll stay with you." Was it I'm going to do speed and agility? And is that all you do? Do you do strength and conditioning too, or how do you, how does that break up? And, and for a guy who's kind of naive to it, yeah. So I think like the whole program that it is now has developed over the years. So okay. when they first started, I was just doing speed, agility, footwork. You know, um, over the years, I think it's become very specific training now so now you have your receivers doing specific stuff and your dbs and linebackers and um so it's it's become more specific but back in the day it was like we're all doing four cone drills we're all doing w drills we're all going to run stadiums and i don't care what position you play the o-line are going to do just the same thing that the dbs did so i think they just wanted to be conditioned you Mm -hmm. know back in the day i feel like the NFL uh, NFL camp was like, hey, y'all got 110s, and these are the times everybody got hit, or, you know, we have gassers, sideline to sideline. These are the times you got to hit, and that was really it. Mm-hmm. But now it's a little it's a little more specific. So it's grown over the years. So then um, I decided I was going to rent out a space from an existing gym. Where, where were you before that? Just Outside. like high school fields? Mm-hmm. Hmm. Yeah. So Lily, so I guess my question is the when in that transition period, right? So like you're making money from under Tony, right? And what was it called? XPE Sports. XPE Sports. So you you getting an income coming in at that time, right? Are you like saving it up to potentially start doing something on your own, or you're like kind of? No, just, I had no idea. Living? This all just kind of fell in my lap. So when they say we're like, look, we're transitioning, I was like, I I either got to, like, you know, apply for other jobs or, you know, they – I don't – I can't even explain what happened. It was just kind of like – Yeah, it it just kind of fell in my lap. And so at that point it was kind of like, you know, obviously I had some money from when I worked under somebody else, you know, just – making my little salary that I had, but um, it was, like, definitely, I really can't, like, had no money. And I just, you know, mm-hmm. rented out a space. Didn't cost too much. Um, but you took that risk. I, I did take a risk. Um, established a LLC, you know. Sure. I didn't know to have a CPA for the first, like, two, three years of me owning my business. And the amount mm. of taxes that I ended up having, like I didn't pay taxes the first like three, at least three, four years. I, I nobody taught me any of this stuff. So you know, I realized I was like, oh, I have to pay taxes, and <laughs> I had to gather, try to do everything I could to Did get. Did you get audited? Who told you? I think I event- eventually got like a CPA. <laughs> 
I mean, I did it the worst way. I would pay myself. I would just write myself a check, you sure. know, and this is what I'm – every time I needed some money, I had a trainer that kind of helped me on the side, mm-hmm. would give him a check, you know, for his time. I had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> and so, learn, it, learn it all on your own. Oh, just as I went, right? Yeah, yeah, um, as you went. Wait, how did you find out about taxes? Like, was someone like, hey, Lily, did you file your tax return? And you're like, huh? Yeah, it was there like a moment like that? It was probably like, a, yeah, definitely just like a moment <laughs> where I realized, oh, I have to pay taxes on my business and for me personally on what I paid myself. Yeah. I had no idea. Yeah. Good learning yeah. experience. Nobody, how old nobody ever told time? me. Like, when you, what was that? When you like first start, how old were you at the time when you first started at this? You know, you're 25, in your 20s? you know, okay, but I, yeah. had, I had no idea like from a business standpoint. Like yeah. what I had to yeah. do. Um, but you had asked me, like, how do things progress? It's funny because I always tell people um, I just felt like I would be pushed into a corner. And it was like I had to make a right turn or a left turn. Left turn was, mm-hmm. I right, you ain't going to do this no more. And the right turn was like, all right, you just got to keep on pushing. And so at the time of me leasing out of a small place, it was like $500 a month maybe. Um, they got bought out by like a hospital. They were going to demolish space, yeah. all of it. And so then I went to another gym and I started leasing from them. Um, and then it was like, everything was like on four year mark. And then four years into the second location, I started getting more and more clients. The word started spreading around Atlanta and, um, it was like one day I looked up and we were out on the field and there was like 40 guys out there. And I was like, mm. how the hell did this just happen? You and started with four. Started with four. And then um, they wanted to go up on my lease. And it was kind of like, well, if I'm going to pay you guys this much, I might as well have a space of my own. So then I went into looking at spaces of my own. Um and then one of the guys that I trained knew I was going to do that. And so he decided to invest in my, you know, vision of having a space of my own. And that ended up being where I am now into DSA Sports and Marietta. So did you guys buy the building? No, we oh. didn't. Okay. That's what, you know, in hindsight, we should have done, right? Yeah. But it was Is it kinda... just a big industrial flex building or what? Mm-hmm. Okay. So it was just a big warehouse and we leased it, you know, the we uh, leased the space out. Kind of didn't know what I was also getting into because mm-hmm. uh, that was like a new chapter. Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't have the same responsibilities um, that I had in the other locations. Like I was renting out space from somebody. It was an existing gym. I didn't own it. You know, it was like, here's $1,000 a month and I get to go about my way. I didn't care about electricity or water or any other expenses that came with it. I didn't even have, like, a payroll system, you know? Mm -hmm. It was just super easy. And now you go into a building where you're leasing, like, a warehouse space from a landlord, and now it's like, oh, I really have to account for every cent that goes into this. Um, So just learning how to kind of allocate everything um, to make sure, like, okay, did we not make money did we break even? Did I make a profit this month? What do I got to do next month? Because I was in the negative the month before. Mm-hmm. So stuff like that. It It's so interesting. And Alec, we, we've talked about it a little bit entrepreneurially, but so many people just move. They just go forward. And then you look back and you have this business, right? Without a plan. And, and it's okay. I think a lot of people never do anything entrepreneurially because they're waiting because they, they're like, oh, I don't know how that works. And like you said, you didn't know how anything worked, right? I mean, you weren't paying your own payroll taxes uh, for the business or for you initially. And and I, there's so much value in just jumping in and trying it. And and you'll figure it out, right? You, because you have to. Right. Like you, you mentioned kind of getting backed up against the wall. Like that's the, the ultimate entrepreneur's journey is you jump in, you're like, I think I'll figure this out. And then, you know, you, you take a step forward and you see what you can see there and you walk a little bit further and you see a little bit further yeah. and you just kind of keep moving down the line. For sure. I mean, 
throughout the whole process, it's like now that I'm in year four in the space that I'm in now, it's like you look back and you're like, oh, I would have done things differently. Mm. Hindsight, right? Yeah. But you don't know that when you're doing it, but it just sets you up to be that much more um, knowledgeable for the future. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. same thing will happen again. You'll do something and then five years will pass and you'll be like, in hindsight. <laughs> but it's just how it goes and you just keep pushing forward. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's super interesting no, that sure. I, I think I'm, I'm always fascinated with people's journeys because there's there's so much you don't know until you're in it. Hmm. And I think, you know, for guys and gals listening to the podcast too, like people, you know, if, if, you're an F, if you're an athlete and you're looking to make that transition entrepreneurially, sometimes you just have to jump in and, you know, you figure out what you figure out along the way. Hopefully you can get some mentorship or somebody who can kind of put their arm around you and be like, hey, you should pay taxes on an annual yeah. basis. <laughs> <laughs> you know, those kinds yeah. of things. But a lot of times it's just it's just winging it, you know? Yeah, yeah. There's a great there's a great analogy that somebody once told me is like the 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 journey of business is like driving on a foggy road. You can only see six feet in front of you, right? So you drive kind of slow, but as soon as you cross that new six feet, another six feet lights up. And then you just keep going. And then eventually, you know, you've you've completed your journey, you know, whatever that is, you know, yeah. you've driven 100 miles or you built a business that you like or or you've made a bunch of money. But, you know, you can't ever see where the outcome is. You're just driving that next six feet in front of you. Right. And it's it's hard to get comfortable with that. At least for me, I'm, I'm a control person. It's hard to to just be like, yeah, we'll figure it out. Oh, I'm, I'm the same. There is no figuring out. I'm like it, it's it's an interesting um, road to take especially when you're not sure as to what's coming in front of you and you feel like you have to take the reins and like control it. But you just got to also kind of leave it to happen the way it's supposed to happen too. So it works out. Yeah, that faith and that belief and just all of that combined. Cause like you said, it's, it's, it's hard. I'm just hearing your story. It's, it, it sounds so similar to like so many guys that like, train. Like they hear one day, then like you said, all of a sudden they transition to doing something else. Or like, and for instance, our, like the team, they just cut us. Now we we ain't got that check coming in no more. So it's like, okay, what am I about to do now? All right, like I can go do this. I I can go do that. But you know, you got to find what you're passionate about. And just hearing your story, I can see why you stuck you stuck in this in that field because of the the determination, the grind, the, everything that you were saying after you I'm like, hey, are you doing it right there yourself? Just going through this business, this business adventure of only, yeah. you know, doing your practice with your gym and stuff. So no, that's, I mean, that's definitely I think for me too, um, I don't like anybody telling me I can't do something. Mm -hmm. And so I knew like that kind of came up a lot um, being in the business. And then just I, I also noticed like when something would be presented to me or if somebody was like, oh, you should do it this way or you, sh you should go this direction. You got to definitely I had to trust my instinct like I there would be if it was a strong no for me. It was a strong no. And I wasn't going to do it. Like what, Lily? Like what? What did somebody bring um, to you? that? Like. I don't know if if it's somebody like tell it like it is. What's that? I said tell it like it is. Yeah, I'm just trying to think of like a an example, but um, if somebody wanted me to run the business a certain way, mm. you know, and yeah, that could have worked. You know, I'm not saying it can't work, but it was like something in would be in me would be like, nope, I'm gonna do it this way. And even if I'm wrong, I could at least say that I failed based on my own wrongs and not somebody else's wrongs. So that was like, you know, I guess you could say like I'm a little headstrong in that sense that somebody will give me advice. Like even when I first started on my own, like my family was like, nah, that's not what you should do. Like you should go back to school. You should go work for somebody. And I was like, nope, I'm going to do this. I don't care if I have no money. This is what I'm going to do. <laughs> so <laughs> for whatever reason. Um, so I think for me and, it, you know, just even when it's like looking at locations and it was like, you should get this place. This is, this is a good place. Nope, that's not it. Yeah. You know, even though it it probably is a great space, there's something in me that's like, nope, there's something, you know, greater 
or a, a better situation. That's your gut. Yeah. That, that's what gut feel is, right? I, gut is just a collection of experiences that hopefully drives you in the right direction. I, I think that's what's talking to you, right? right. You're just like, eh, that feels bad. Right. And so, Chris, I mean. did you just make that up? No, that's what it is. That like when that's you say like I'm I'm trusting my gut. That's your gut is just a collection yeah. of experiences. But I think even like further to me it's like I don't want to fail based on another mm. person's insight. Like if I'm going to fail, at least I could say I failed because I messed yeah. up. <laughs> I'd rather that, that was me. than you know somebody else. I, I feel like that's most people feel like that. Yeah. Especially especially just like you being like the owner, like just having that mindset, like no, this is this is my baby. Man. Mm. I'm developing this from the ground up. So like, yeah, you you hear you hear other people's opinion and you take it for what it is. Just it's, it's like like how to coach. They would they would give us plenty of information, right? Like all we've all wanted this opponent or whatever. They give us thousands of information. It's overload, right? But like, how do you decipher like what you can take for yourself to help you go out there and perform the way you need it? Now, granted, they got all the air. They got you can go right here, you can look it up, and all this. But at the same time, like, what what are you doing? It's a difference between what you said on this paper to going out there and, and experiencing it and seeing, okay, they running this play or this happened in this business. I didn't. Even see that like i might have glossed over that in the when i was reading about it or whatever but it, you know it kind of played out differently in the game you know what i mean so right like i said it's, i see the the, the the resemblance of it, the similarity of it for sure where where's the business today lily so you you rent the space it's your fourth year how big is the space uh, so we're running about 15,800 square foot facility. Okay. Um, great space. Um, like we have batting cages and a field area and, you know, nice weight room amenities with like hot tubs, cold tubs. Um, so we actually, you know, we're in a place where do we continue to lease? Mm. Do I look outside? Do I try to find a building to buy? Like we're kind of at a crossroads, you know? Um, do I just lease for a short, shorter term and then maybe buy later? Is so the lease up for expiration now or is it you're almost at the year. term? Yeah. One more year. Um, so just kind of weighing out the options. Um, what's best moving forward? How, how many, just walk me through some of the numbers on the business. How many clients ish? Oh my God. Ish. It, it, you know, it's, it's so interesting with this business because it is very, it can be very seasonal, right? Sure. So, um, you know, from February to July, that's our high time. And we have like, I mean, hundreds of athletes that come through. And then during like that, you know, August, September, October-ish time, it kind of dies down. But we do have like hundreds of athletes that walk through those doors. And are um, you still training amateurs as well like high school kids yeah I love I mean I'll go from middle school all the way to pros um, and I have trainers that work under me how many um, how many trainers in the business so I have two strength trainers and two other speed agility trainers um, during the high time of the year with the NFL guys um, I pretty much hire like DB coach a receiver coach okay um, so they're like hire contractors was that I'm gonna send you my contract for the linebacker coach I got you. You already got a job. They're the best, though. You know, guys who have trained with me, they kind of know what I do. Um, and then they help later on with like the skills work. But was yeah. it a hard transition, your first group of employees? Because then you become a manager, too, right? You talk about infrastructure stuff in the business, right? Taxes, you know, how yeah. your building works. But then a whole nother level is managing people who think differently than you. It's your baby. It's your vision. Like, how was that transition for you? Um, managing people is probably the hardest aspect of the business. Mm. Um, but, you know, I've had to fire people. I've had to do that. That's not very fun. Um, but it's like you you have to make sure that you're in al alignment with all these people, um, that they understand your vision um, that they work well with you. And so I think right now I have like a very good team, which I'm super thankful for. Um, so 
you know, everybody kind of understands uh, their roles and, um, you know, what we need to do to continue to move forward. Because, you know, we do, we want to see DSA grow and um, be able to service more people and help the community and stuff like that. So you have to have a good team. And so I'm thankful that we got there so far so good. Um, they get out of line. Yeah, you know. It's over with. <laughs> <laughs> what what do you see as vision? So like what's the next five years for you? I mean, growth wise, obviously you gotta figure out the real estate piece. My yep. advice would always be buy the real estate. Absolutely. If, if you can find a model that works for you, try yes. to find a way to do that because 20 years from now that real estate's gonna be worth more than it is today. Absolutely. So that's always the end goal. Mm. Um, you know, as long as at least for this business, so just keeping it one hundred. Gyms don't have the highest financial upside um, as a business, right? Um, it just, it, they just don't. Mm. But there is a way, um, you know, through buying a building or land and kind of building where it's like, okay, there is that return when when you do buy. Mm -hmm. As long as you keep leasing, your money is going yourself. out. Yeah, it, yeah, it's just going out the window. Um, and it's like every time you do have a profit, it's like that money has to go right back into the business to continue functioning. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's just like a revolving door. So it's harder to see a return in a gym business than other businesses, let alone a gym business that is specific towards certain demographics, right? So it's not like a LA fitness where they do memberships. Like we're very like skills, sports, it's different. So it's, it's a little harder. But is is it a subscription model? Like if I'm if I'm an athlete, am I paying you monthly or is it per mm -hmm. session or what is, is like, hey, I so need you for four options. months? Uh, okay. You know, because we have like middle school, high school groups, it's it's a little different than, a you know, pro athlete coming in for the off season. So we have monthly we have packages um, for the athletes. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. But that revenue cycle, I mm -hmm. assume, is. Yeah. Up and down. Bumpy. I mean, thank God, though, I've tapped into a side of the business where I'm going from one off season to the next off season to the next off season. Baseball, football. Yeah. yeah. Whereas I think sometimes in this business as trainers that want to do speed and agility, they get caught up in I'm going to make sure that I'm working with receivers. And it's like, well, that, what are you going to do the rest of the year? You know, how are you going to make your money? You know, un unless maybe you do some like, you know, online stuff is always good, you know, tutorials, but you know, I get to work with soccer girls and, you know, baseball players and football players. So it's like you have to be able to broaden your horizons with athletes. You can't just think I'm going to only train soccer players or I'm only going to work with DBs. Um, and sometimes I think in the world of skills training and speed and agility, people get caught up with just a very narrow minded path. Um, so you got to be able to be a little more open minded. Mm. Yeah. Is, is it, if you had to do it over again, would you, what, what would you have done differently? I, I won't, I guess, railroad that question. Like you, you, you talk about through your experience, like, Hey, look back, I'd change this. I'd change that. What would you tell Lily when somebody says, Hey, we're relocating. You got to go start your own thing. How, how would you approached it differently? Um, I think for me, I really wouldn't change anything because each each segment that I've had to like go through, you know, in this journey, it's like it taught me for the next thing. So I there's no way I could have done what I do now without having gone through the lessons um, of of just the process. Right. Mm -hmm. I think for me, it would be just make sure you trust yourself. Don't second guess yourself, you know, like 25 year old Lil. um, I think it would just be like, think bigger. I think I, I have also like, as I've gone through the process, I'm really big about like small steps, not really thinking bigger though. And I think it's okay to think bigger. Like mm -hmm. it, it, don't be intimidated by um, a bigger dream or, or something like that. But what do you mean? Think, what do you mean? Like, um, I think, you know, when I first started, it was just like, I'm just going to train. I'm just a trainer. Like, you know, that's all I want to do. Like, I'm not going to have my own place. I, I don't want to do, you know. 
And for whatever reason, it's like, no, like, it's okay if you want your own place. Like, it's okay to think bigger. Um, even now, today, it's like, you know, I think about, like, little baby steps, which is good. I'm all about, like, um, building blocks, right? They always say, like, what kind of person are you? Are you the carpenter or the planner? Do you like to, you know, put the seeds in the soil and water them from time to time and see it grow? Or are you that carpenter that likes to build? Mm -hmm. And so I notice like I'm more of the carpenter, like I'll take it one piece at a time. But I just feel like while I'm doing that, don't think on such a smaller scale, like always think bigger. Um, and yeah. I don't think I did that when I was younger. I don't know. I don't, I would I think I think like you said, kind of you going through those through those process, through those steps, it helped you like kind of grow and and be able to think like, oh yeah, now I can I can do this because I I've mastered this part of it, right? Like I've mastered, I know what to do when I'm training and like so I got that piece. Like that's like back of my second nature. Now it's like, okay, I go to this building. I'm learning about how to lease. Like I'm learning about you know, how this works. Oh, I'm now I wasn't responsible for that at the time, but now I'm responsible for it. So it's, it's kind of like you said, kind of a building block where like, to me, it's not that you're not thinking bigger. It's more like you, you're taking each step and mastering it. And then, but still, like I said, you still have a, a goal of like, now you're like, yeah, I want to have my own gym. Like I want to. Yeah. It's been a process, yeah. but what I'm saying is, like, even when I was leasing, I just felt like, oh, this is just it. Like, I'm just going to keep leasing. Mm. You yeah. know, like, I didn't think for one moment, like, no, Lil, like, you can get bigger. You can own a building. It's more like for me, which I've been thankful for, and that's why I wouldn't change anything. It's like the steps is what has led me to get to a point of thinking bigger. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I kind of wish that I would have trusted myself a little more to think bigger a little earlier. Um, I probably would have gotten through the process faster is what I'm saying. Yeah, Alec, mm -hmm. I, I agree with you that the process is important. Right. But I yeah. think you if you have a goal that you're working towards that might be a little bit bigger or if you have a mentor or someone who can put their arm around you and help you step through those, you know, or uh, walk up those steps a little bit quicker – I think that's always the that's always the thing. I um, you know we said on the episode uh, number four with uh, or number five with with Mac Brown, big deals and small deals are the same amount of work, right? Mm -hmm. You just make less money on small deals, and so you're going to spend your time whether you're a four person training facility, you know, renting in the back of somebody's gym, or you know you got hundreds of pro athletes in a sixteen thousand square foot facility. You're still going to work forty to sixty hours a week. Right. Mm -hmm. One, you're probably going to make more money than the other. And in right. real estate, that's what we talk about. Right. Big deals, small deals. We're spending the same energy. You're just going to make money on a bigger deal. And, and I think it's also helpful when you have someone who can help with that, who's done it and can say, hey, Lily, what about this? Right. You know, what if we shot for that? You know, I think when you're building it internally, it's hard to look outside of what you have because there's nothing to see. You haven't seen it before. Right. I think that's always a, you know, the, the mentorship thing when we talk with some of the guys about what they can do during their playing years, find those guys and gals who have the influence or who have done what they want to do and latch on. Because, you know, just like you, like, you know, people want to be with pro athletes, you know, and when they're playing a guy like Alex, like, hey, I'm Alec Ogletree anywhere in Georgia. If you're a Georgia fan, you know who he is. Right. And it opens a lot of doors. I think that's a big piece that a lot of guys miss the opportunity of if they're going to go be entrepreneurial, we'll build those foundational blocks when people want to meet with you. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a lot easier when you're a pro athlete than when you're just a guy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that's a, 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 an interesting piece for all entrepreneurs is just those, those blocks are, if you set your sights big, it's just build to something. Right. I think for me, it was like, and that's why I'm saying I, I was kind of put into a corner. I was kind of forced to think to the next step where mm -hmm. when I was there, I wasn't thinking of the next step. Like, what's the next big thing? Like, if I yeah. if they had never gone up in their rent in the space I was You'd at still before, be there. I'd probably still be there. You know, I was it was just that content. 
I wasn't thinking bigger, like, no, Lil, like, you got to get out of here and do something bigger. And so that's why I'm saying I get in a corner and then it's like, oh, no, shit, I got to do something else. Mm -hmm. Let you in free. You don't shut down. That's No, that's, I can't shut that's down. The, that's the key part to me is a lot of people just kind of, they, they hit a wall, they hit a brick, whatever, bump in the road is like, all right, I'm done. But I think that's like the difference between successful entrepreneurs and those who don't quite make it. Like for me, like say it's the dog inside of me, I refuse to fail and I refuse to go backwards. Okay. Um, so it's like I always tell the guys in training, I'm like when we run sprints, right, somebody will set the standard on a certain time in their sprint. I'm like, all right, the, st the standard has been set. You're either going to meet it or you're going to exceed it, but nobody can go below it. I actually think I said that to you on the track one time, Tree. Yeah. We were on the track running, and we were getting around the curve, and it was him and another guy. And I told the guys, I was like, yeah, y'all can, like, kind of, like, walk around the curve. I started jogging, and Tree, I passed Tree up. He's like, I thought you said we could walk. I was like, well, I started jogging, so you can either meet me or you can <laughs> stay behind me. But, you know, there is nothing else in between. I know what Alec did. He What'd started. you do? Took my ass off. <laughs> <laughs> I probably started walking, actually. <laughs> it, it depends on it. Yeah. I, I have a kind of another question. How do you deal with just, and, and <clears throat> seeing Alec interact with you and a lot of the other guys, they have a lot of respect for you. How do you, how do you interact with guys who are elite, uh, alpha males, and you're in an environment that typically is not dominated by female people, right? I mean, just think of, you know, the guys that Alec are around 24-7 and guys like Alec. How do you manage that? You got to learn to humble their little asses <laughs> down. <laughs> no, I mean, I think, um, I mean, like I said, I think there's a standard I set that it's like, this is what it is. And, you know, I, I like working out with the guys, so I think that helps. Um, I don't know. I, I, I just think uh, I have high expectations, and I think they kind of can hmm. feel that energy. Um, was it always that way, or did, was that earned for you? Because I, I'm just thinking about, you know, the first four guys. Like, now people come to you, and there's an expectation because other people have said, hey, you know, Alec Ogletree calls and says, hey, you got to go train with Lily. That, that means something. Was that always there? Um, I think a little bit, but I think, like I said, like I, I like to work out with the guys, so I think a lot of the guys are always saying I think that pushes them. Mm. Like I'm over here running sprints with you. Like you can't possibly be any more tired than me. And yeah, she's rounding you up. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that definitely helps. Mm. Yeah. Alec, how did, you, how did you interpret that? Like when you trained with Lily – what was what was the mind? I mean, did you think like, well, here's this I mean, little, little lady who's teaching me how to run sprints? Like, how did you think of it? Or be a linebacker? Yeah, be a linebacker. <laughs> yeah, I mean, literally, like, I had trained like with different people all over, like in multiple cases, multiple spots, right? And so, for me, it was just like a new opportunity to go in and kind of I've seen I've saw guys go in seen uh, videos and stuff at first, right? And kind of, I forgot who I reached out to. I reached out to somebody and, was, oh, Alan, the guy, you know, used to work for you, actually. Um, was seeing him there and stuff, and, and you know, kind of kept up with it, never, I think at that time, I was training somewhere in Buckhead when I first started looking, but I ended up leaving that place, and I was looking, I think this was what, my, third to fourth year of almost done, I guess, three, four years, probably like four years ago now, I guess. Um, and so I was looking for a place to train and, you know, I wanted to work on like speed, all that stuff, like you say, speed and agility and all that stuff like that, right? I wasn't really into like a lot of heavy lifting stuff like that because most of the places I used to go to, but it was all like the Olympic lifts and kind of all that kind of stuff like that. And so I was like, man, I, I really just need to work on my speed, my movement, like being in the right position, you know, to 
change direction and all this stuff. And, you know, it, it worked out. And the, the fact that where I called it, I was like, hey, I want to come in. She was like, okay, come in. We, I think we started with a, a couple of private lessons at first. And I was like, okay. And then she was like, I have a group session with the other guys in the league and stuff. And then, so I came to that session. And I was like you said, you saw how the guys were interacting with her and kind of the work ethic that the standard that was set there. And I was like, man, I can, I, I like that. Like that's, that's something that I needed at that time for, to help me, you know, continue my career and playing. And so I was always grateful to be there. And just, like I said, having a conversation with Billy, understanding her as a woman, as a entrepreneur, as a business owner, just as a person, you know, it, it uh, it meant everything. It meant a lot to me at the time, for sure. So, you know, like I say I'm always grateful for the time we spent training. Granted, I have retired, so you know, I'm, I do, I do do tennis now. So I, I just start coming back to do that. But you know, y'all gonna see me in a minute over one day. I I'm hope so. You, I'm gonna be there. I'm gonna be there. Don't throw but, your back um, out though. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, I ain't, I'm not putting too much weight on it. It's a little <laughs> different. I ain't got to bang it to nobody. I ain't got to do none of that. I just go chase this ball around and hit it. Great sport. So, but, yeah, yeah. No, for sure. So, like I said, it's, it was it was awesome, like I said, getting to know her and just be around her. And like I said, see the how she just ran the business, how she, how she trained everybody. She treated everybody the same. And everybody, you know, you can respect that. And the work speaks for itself. Thanks. Good for you, Lily. That, it can't be easy. I, I mean, I'm I'm just envisioning thirty dudes in a room who are yeah. all Alec Ogletree's. Like that's intimidating. At least would be for me. I just yell back. Yeah, I just yell back. <laughs> Fair. Mm -hmm. I so I have I have one more question. Then I want to I want to hear more about like what you see with the guys and how they think about what's next. You know, because you know if you train Alec years three through eight you know, seven, eight, and nine, and Alex knowing that the, the run's almost over, right? You know, he's got more time behind him than he does ahead of him. Um, but in the business side of things, what's the, what's the one lesson that entrepreneurially you would tell somebody who's starting their own thing? It doesn't have to necessarily be fitness training, um, but what's that one lesson that you'd be like, look, make sure this? Um, I think... For me, it's just, you know, obviously if you're going in with like other people, making sure that you protect yourself, mm. um, your own assets, you know. Um, I, I mean, I think that's that's one of the I've been I've been good to to say that, like when I went into business, like everything's been protected. But I think a lot of people tend to um, get into business with other people and you know, whatever, you know, people think differently. People have a different end goal. You think one way, things might change. Um, so I think it's just, um, you know, make sure that you protect yourself and your business and um, know, like, what what your end goal is um, at all times, you know. So Yeah, partners. Yeah. It, it'll make or break, make or break. Yeah. Yeah. And everybody has partners, you know, it, like very few times do you ever see like business people and it's just like one person owning this one thing. Like you, you're always going to have partners. Like sometimes there's 10 people in a group, you know, so just making sure that everybody's aligned. Yeah. Expectation, I think, is a huge part of it. Right. That mm -hmm. that whoever's in that partnership has the same expectation as what you're trying to accomplish, because otherwise, I mean, that's true of everything. Right. Relationships, you know, personal relationships jobs if your expectations aren't aligned it's right. tough it's really hard yeah is is there something that you see kind of as a pattern you know with beyond the game we're trying to create a community for athletes to essentially say hey here's a group of people you can trust to learn from and and you've worked with guys across all spans of of sports and careers and probably guys who've had long-standing careers guys like Alec and guys who've been in the league a few years what how are they thinking about the beyond part? Or, or is that something maybe you don't you don't know? I mean, into too much? I definitely one thing about being, you know, a trainer of these guys, we, we do have like, you know, deep conversations after the workouts and, you know, 
what are you going to do? Are you going to play one more year? If you don't play one more year, what are you going to do? Um, so I, I definitely see, like, there's guys who put their money in stocks, you know, different types of stocks. I'm not very good at stuff like that. And then there are guys that, you know, they come out, especially guys who may not have made that much money, and they're kind of like, I don't have no idea what I'm going to do. You know, it's just trying to find their path. So I try to tell guys, like, for me, like, when we have these conversations, I think sometimes the guys get lost in this in the aspect that this is what you do. You're an athlete. You play football. But this isn't who you are. This was just, you know, part of a path to get you to where you're supposed to be and in, in your, pur- your full purpose and what you're supposed to be doing. Um, Alec, for you, that's the Atlanta Open, baby. Just saying. Yeah. I'm here it, for it. It's more like a resource, right? Mm-hmm. So football has become like a resource to set you up for the next step. Um, so I think getting them first to understand that aspect. Because um, they do. Like a lot of guys kind of get lost with that identity of I'm just a fo- you know, I'm a football player. And I'm like, you're mm-hmm. not going to play football when you're like, you know, 38, 40, you know, so it's just kind of trying to get them to understand this is a resource. Mm. This is a part of the journey, but it's not, you know, how you're really going to make your money. Mm. This is, you know, I mean, Jalen Brown made some money. So other than JV, (laughs) but, you know, for the most, for most guys, right? So I think that's step one. But even Jalen Brown's got to figure out what to do with it. He's going to make money, but you... I've seen it, right? I'm sure Alec has too. Your lifestyle can still outspend you. That's absolutely right. Especially in the world you guys live in. I mean. I have seen it. I have seen guys where they filed for bankruptcy and you'd be like, you made millions of dollars. Like, where'd it go? Alec, Um, tell her where it went. RC cars. (laughs) (laughs) I called. So Alec was our first guest. So I called his wife, whose name is Alex. And said, Alex, what was the stupidest thing that Alec bought that you were upset about? And she didn't even hesitate. She's like, before he was drafted, we were in Arizona. He went to the mall and bought a $900 RC car. She's like, we didn't have anything. And he was, Alex, tell her, you were so pumped about it. You crashed it and broke it, but. Broke that thing in probably like two days. That shit was too fast, really. Oh. <laughs> but yeah. I, couldn't, I couldn't control it that really well. <laughs> Yeah, I like ran into the wall and like smashed. But I did. Like I love doing this stuff. Um, so I guess I, my my next question would be would be respectful of your time. You know, we appreciate you being here. But when you see those guys come in after being like cut or release or whatever have you, right? Like they're thinking about retiring or whatever and they, well, they let me interrupt you for the longest though i think guys hold on hmm. too long sometimes yeah it's like dude like you ain't gotten picked up in three years like yeah what are we gonna do here you know yeah and they're and they're coming to you saying i'm gonna get picked up this year you know it's the hope it's the hope that they're gonna play again because they're not ready to let go right yeah. and I think that's the other thing, you know, and and I could say this about myself. It's like having the strength to let go so you're not holding on too long, you mm-hmm. know, and it's like for them, I see that a lot. Mm-hmm. It's like you got to let go so that you can move on to the next. But that goes back to your identity thing, right? Like yeah. they know one thing. You know, yeah. you spent your whole yeah. life on a thing and it's hard to to look outside those blinders. And like you said, Father Time catches everybody, right? Yeah. Eventually, you have to transition to something else. But like you said, mm. it's kind of like, you know, community, um, finding what you love to do outside of this. Is it buying homes, you know, flipping homes? Is it you want to go into the gym business? Um, do you want to go into coaching? Like, there are things beyond the beyond game. Beyond the game, right? baby. Alec, did you pay her to say that? I did not. <laughs> You see how I can I it just flow. <laughs> yeah. You can't it's, pay somebody to do that. No. I, I think that's that's the whole purpose, right? Is is trying to help people understand I guess we have more of the wealth tilt. You're talking about 
a little bit of that, but also just personality. Like there's someone there. Alex, 31, mm-hmm. right? I mean, it's hard 32. to. All right, 32. But he's a baby, right? Like I'm, I'm 43, and I feel like when I'm sitting with somebody, I'm like, your career is done. Right. You know, like his career is done. And in our world, and we were just talking about this, is we're just ramping up, right? 30 to 35, you're still figuring out what you're going to be. And then then you start to earn some money because you figured out like, all right, I'm good at this. I don't like doing that. Where these guys, exactly. as athletes, you know, from 20 to 30, that's the money. And right. then, then you got to figure out, well, who am I going to be from 30 to 100? That's hard. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's a hard transition to make. It's not, it's not easy. Yeah. But I love I love your philosophy of the sport is a resource. It's it's a philosophical way to think about it, but it's a resource that got you here and it's going to lead you to wherever you're going. That's right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's a great way to think about it. Alec, you got anything else for Lily? No, Lily. I really appreciate you again for coming on and wish I was there. But uh, I know no, I, I can't really believe you're not here. Your insight, everything that you share with us today. Um, if somebody's looking to find you, where can they get at you at? Just so we have it out there. Um, um, so Instagram at okay. Lily DSA Training is where most people find me. Okay. So, watch those Facebook. videos. Watch the one where she deeks everybody. That's. My- <laughs> Sorry, Al. You said what? I said, watch those videos. The one where she deeks out everybody. Basically, she lines up as a wide receiver and has people play DB against her. is very impressive. <laughs> you, need, you need to put that one on the on. Did you have it on the ground where you uh, shook? Uh, what's his name? Um, dang, what's his name? You remember you made him fall? Actually, I made him it, fall. That was inside. Like he. Had, it's, it's an older video. You know, I can't remember his name. Dang. Kenny Ladler. I think so. I don't know. He's broke. Yeah, it was Kenny. Ankles. It is Kenny. It is definitely Kenny. Yeah. It's, definitely it's but, kind of uh, funny. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank, thank you, Lily. You're welcome. We appreciate it. It was appreciate a pleasure. It. it was a pleasure. Thank you for tuning in to Beyond the Game. Please like, subscribe, comment on your favorite platform. It helps others find the show. Special shout out to Open Heart Media, who has helped produce Beyond the Game. Check them out at openheartmediaco.com.